thank you for sitting down with us. You're welcome. I wanted to chat with you for a couple weeks now. We really do appreciate you making time to have a conversation. Um, I understand you wanted to start with a couple statements. So if you had something you'd like to say right off the top, go for it. Well, it sounds good. I w wanna thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about this really important issue for society generally, uh, for us here in Alaska and for our university. Uh, we try to lead in all we do, whether it's research, whether it's teaching and learning, uh, whether it's serving our community. From our very founding back in 1917 to a little over 100 years later, we try to lead. Uh, we're not perfect, uh, no question about that. We face challenges as we try to lead. Um, but nevertheless, uh, while we're not perfect, why we, while we will make mistakes, uh, as any human complex organization will, uh, we will relentlessly seek to provide our students, our faculty, our staff, community members uh, who are on our campuses a safe place to learn, uh, to work, uh, to play, uh, to gather, to talk. Uh, so uh, that's our commitment to Alaska, and we will be relentless in pursuing that commitment. I know this topic is something, um, at least I've, I perceive this as a topic that's something you're personally passionate about. Um, why is it that you think college campuses seem to be so susceptible to these patterns of uh, sexual harassment and discrimination and unfortunately sometimes assault? Yeah, the, the literature on this is really interesting and then our, our own experience. Uh, I think, you know, when I first went off to college, I was 17 years old and, um, you know, I thought I had good judgment. I thought I was a mature person, but I, I think a lot of us are not quite correct in that, right? So we go off and we explore things, we try things, uh, and, uh, and our, our judgment may not be the best. But when you think about pulling together thousands and thousands and thousands of 17, 18, 22 year olds, uh, you're gonna have some mistakes being made. Uh, and I think another thing that I have saw, uh, and I really learned a lot from watching a, uh, a really stunning documentary called Hunting Ground uh, when I got into this job and started confronting uh, this issue directly. And there are predators out there. So it's not just people making mistakes or applying poor judgment. Uh, there are people out there who intentionally focus on college campuses, and they intentionally focus on college campuses in the fall. Uh, it's a period of time from just prior to registration in the beginning of a term uh, and Thanksgiving. And it's called the red zone uh, by people who uh, are professionals in this area, and it's because that's the most vulnerable time when you have uh, young people on campus often for the first time uh, and you have uh, people out there who are literally predators who know what they're doing and they're they're going after uh, vulnerable people uh, so those are i think a couple of reasons why uh, college campuses in particular are vulnerable and again we're microcosms of society generally uh, so if there's a big issue out in society a problem uh, we're gonna experience it no question about it can you say with confidence today that the University of Alaska system is completely compliant with the federal Title IX statute? Yes, uh, we are compliant uh, with the statute. Uh, we negotiated with the federal government what's called a voluntary resolution agreement, uh, and we have been in very close compliance uh, with the standards there uh, in terms of our reporting uh, to the federal government. Uh, in terms of Title IX, uh, per se, uh, in terms of, you know, sometimes there are issues in terms of getting cases wrapped up, fully investigated uh, within the recommended period of time. So some cases, because of their complexity, because of their age, you know, in the Me Too era now that we're in, some of these cases may be 25, 30 years old. So the ability to actually fully investigate completely a case in 60 days is a little uh, tough. Well, it's extremely difficult to accomplish. Uh, but in terms of everything else we're doing, mandatory training, uh, the reporting, uh, uh, we're doing a terrific job. Another requirement was that there be uh, an executive uh, at the system, university system level, reporting directly to me, uh, who is our chief Title IX officer, and we've done that, and that's been a terrific, uh, I think, gain uh, for us in terms of having somebody who's focused on, on this issue every second of every day. Uh, we have a tracking system so that all of our cases, whether they're from Ketchikan to Kotzebue, Kodiak, Anchorage, Fairbanks, wherever, they're all in a single tracking system so that we know exactly where all the cases are. 
Uh, our Board of Regents gets an update at every one of their meetings. I get an update every single month uh, on how compliant we are with every one of the guidelines. And I'm pleased to say that over the last several reports, it's been green, 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 green in terms of compliance. Looking back at this topic, specifically as it relates to the University of Alaska, um, the system hasn't always been in compliance with Title IX in, in previous years. At what point on the timeline, where's the turning point where we weren't in compliance and then here we turned it around and we are now in compliance? Yeah, I think the, the turning point really came shortly before I got to the university. And I think it was in late 2014 uh, that the university regents uh, became aware of challenges and then uh, they uh, convened uh, an investigation, had auditors looking at things. And uh, so it was really that early 2015 or the first half of 2015 when they were really assessing the extent of the challenge. And of course about that time the federal government was conducting a compliance review of the University of Alaska along with about 200 other universities across the country. And so uh, that's all going on. And while the university was conducting uh, its review and pulling together all of the paperwork to provide to the Federal Department of Education as part of that compliance review, uh, they read the documents. And so when I came into the role in uh, late summer of 2015, it was uh, uh, literally the first issue that was put on my desk. Uh, I came into the role expecting budget challenges, not nearly as serious as we're facing today, but I, I came into it expecting those issues. I, I, having worked at the university years before, understood a lot of the organizational dynamics and the politics and, and, uh, uh, and all of that. Uh, I didn't expect this or know about this, uh, and it was the very first issue put on the table. And the very first question was, what are we going to do about it? Uh, are we going to do what other universities across the country have done, which is to wait until the compliance review is done, completed, uh, and it goes public? I asked the question, well, how long is that going to take? Well, based on other universities' experience, it's probably going to be 18 months or two years before that happens. And I thought, wow, that seems like a really long time. And then I asked, who's likely to be uh, at the press conference uh, when the disclosure is made to the public. Well, of course, that's going to be you. You're the head of the university. You're the spokesperson for the university. And I thought, wow, you know, is that the right thing to do? Uh, to wait 18 months or two years prior to letting our students know, letting our faculty know, letting our communities know uh, that we have this challenge, and waiting two years to get going on remedying these issues, staffing up, doing the training, etc. So. Uh, we disclosed. We were the first university in the country to disclose proactively prior to the conclusion of the compliance review that we had problems and that we were going to set out to address those problems. And then there was the letter and the agreement that right. came out in early 2017. At that point, was the university in, let's say, February 2017 in compliance or did, it, did that full compliance come after that agreement? Uh, we worked very hard to get into compliance at the point by the time we entered into the agreement with the federal government. Okay. Uh, actually, it, it uh, turned out that the feds were very um, amenable. They, they uh, were very complimentary of the proactive steps that we had taken, given, again, that we were the first uh, institution to proactively disclose and get about fixing the problems. I don't think we were perfect at that point, uh, and we still face challenges today, as I, as I indicated. Uh, in, in terms of staffing, for example, you know, in terms of uh, this is burnout work, right, for, for the staff uh, who do this work every single day. So that becomes an issue, just recruiting and retaining people in this uh, high demand field all across the country. Title IX investigators, Title IX coordinators are in super high demand. Uh, so that's, uh, that's been a challenge as well. But I think we really were generally in compliance by the time we negotiated that agreement with the feds in early 2017 and have steadfastly been sticking to that, uh, that compliance since then. So when we look at the, I think it's the most recent university Title IX report card, it says there are 86 um, recorded Title IX reports and there are zero recorded sanctions or disciplinary actions. What do you make of those numbers? 
You know, it's a, it's a good question, and I haven't been into those specific cases at all. I, I do know that the vast majority of Title IX complaints are actually not, strictly speaking, Title IX complaints. Uh, they end up uh, generally being human resources type uh, complaints and not meeting the strict definition of a, of a Title IX uh, violation. So that is, that is a, a major uh, component, uh, I think. And you know, I don't know where, you know, again, without knowledge of the specific 86 cases that you mentioned, where they are in the, in the process. Either it could be that, are those completed uh, investigations? Um, let's see, so I, I believe some of them are completed. Mm -hmm. You know, I think something that we also talk about with Title IX, and it, you can look at this if you want, that's sure. where I got that information. Um, Sometimes people make a report and they don't want to follow through with an investigation, so that's also a factor. Yeah. However, I think uh, that says eight of them were reached a point where there was someone willing to go forward and there was cause to go forward. So eight out of yeah. 86. Right, so thank you for that and, and showing me this. And when I see this report, I look at the total, 86, and then I look down that highlighted column. Well, how many were really Title IX complaints? Uh, eight of the, so 10%, roughly. You know, something like that. And then uh, you're right in terms of the disposition of these, what, five investigations ongoing, uh, and interim measures were provided to the complainants. Uh, so that's an important thing which we may want to talk about uh, here too, what are uh, interim measures. And then the investigation uh, complete in three of these cases. So it doesn't surprise me that we wouldn't have sanctions from eight cases. That, that doesn't surprise me. If there were 86 real Title IX verified cases, then I would say that's a problem, uh, that we don't have any sanctions out of 86 verified Title IX complaints. If there are eight, which is the case, uh, then that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, so if, if once these all wrap up and there's zero sanctions, once all eight are completed, that's, would that still not be surprising to you? It would not surprise me there. Again, it would surprise me a great deal if there were 86 truly verified Title IX cases that had been investigated and there weren't significant sanctions, that would be, that would, uh, be cause for what's going on here. A lot of what I have written about in terms of uh, the University of Alaska system lately hasn't been positive. Um, I've covered uh, the Title IX investigation findings with Dr. Yesner, uh, the following federal lawsuit. Um, there's, a, there's public scrutiny is this intense level of scrutiny fair to the university, in your opinion, given the steps you've outlined that you've, from day one, been taking to address this issue? Do you think it's fair to be under the microscope and have received some of the public criticism that is out there? Absolutely, I think it's fair. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, we lead uh, in our state. Uh, we have challenges, and I believe as a public university and a university where uh, students must, faculty, staff must feel safe or as safe as they possibly can, uh, I think it's absolutely a, a reasonable and fair thing for the media and for journalists like yourself uh, to scrutinize us uh, very seriously. I have no problem with that at all. If we can't stand up uh, and, uh, and be transparent uh, in, in how we deal with cases like this, uh, then uh, I think that's a real serious problem that we need to remedy. So I, I welcome the scrutiny. It, uh, it makes us better. When I look at this, I personally wonder, is Dr. Yesner a fluke or are there others? I don't know. Is this one person who slipped through the system or is he a symptom of an of a, a issue that still uh, has not been fully addressed? Uh, it's very difficult uh, for me to say. I, you know, in the in the literature and in this field, people, experts, talk about something called the missing stair. That may be a concept you're familiar with, where, you know, you get used to it. Uh, there's a missing step on a uh, on the stairway going up the back deck, uh, and you just step over it, and you go, oh yeah, that's the missing stair, and you stop noticing it after a while. And I think that's a phenomenon that uh, is is not uncommon in organizations, uh, whether it's a, a Title IX, whether it's somebody who's engaging in sexual harassment or whether it's somebody who doesn't show up to meetings on time or somebody who, whatever the, the issue is, and we accommodate. Uh, humans are very good at accommodating for others. And I think it can become very problematic, and that's why actually I am extremely pleased. I mean, I would like 
uh, our complaints to be zero because I would like the problems in the area of sexual harassment across our campuses to be zero. Uh, but as you've uh, reported, there has been an increase in reporting. And I don't know, in fact, I suspect that there hasn't been an increase in the actual frequency of cases. But the fact that people are reporting, I think, is a really, really positive thing. It says that people are saying, wait a second, we're not just going to step over that missing stare anymore. We're going to report it. Uh, and I think that's, a, frankly, a, a vote of confidence uh, in the steps that we have taken to, you know, we've added staff, we have uh, really um, encouraged training, mandated training. Uh, and really encourage people to report these cases. So that's the big uptick, I think, is largely because of that. And then I think there's a climate now where we're, uh, we're moving on these cases, perhaps not as quickly as complainants in particular uh, or respondents would like, uh, but we're moving on these cases. We're not just, uh, we're, we do not have an environment at this point uh, that is putting a, a wet blanket on people who are complaining about these, these concerns. There are allegations that even as recently as 2018, a complainant tried calling several times a week trying to reach the Title IX office. Um, you know, we've, it's also been publicized that a Title IX investigator uh, was hired uh, when he actually had allegations against himself in this same arena of allegations of being a predator and, and uh, he was removed. Do you think instances like that, while they are allegations, do you think that they have damaged trust between the Title IX offices and students? Uh, I, th you know, they may have, uh, hard to speculate. Uh, I think that, I, as I indicated, these are tough positions to fill. Uh, there's very high burnout uh, uh, in these positions. They're dealing with very emotional, very, very difficult uh, issues. You know, in the case of the uh, person we hired uh, who had complaints against him, we did a thorough background check on him. Uh, and got all kinds of positive, you know, reviews and references and that sort of thing. And it was because of a complaint about him here at the University of Alaska uh, that he was moved on. We later found out uh, about the complaints elsewhere. Uh, so in that case, uh, you know, I actually, we did our best before we hired the person. And then while he was employed, we found Internally, we found the issue and moved him on. Uh, and it was only later again that we found out uh, about these other issues, unfortunately. And then um, what about faculty members mm -hmm. that might shield a Title IX violator, uh, discourage someone from reporting when I understand there's been training, everyone knows they're supposed to send those uh, reports on to the Title IX office. Moving forward, just as there are consequences for someone violating Title IX, are there consequences for someone protecting someone in that position? Oh, there sure should be. Uh, yeah, I mean, if someone's aware of a case and they don't raise it, uh, that's a problem. They're mandated reporters. That's the language, mandated reporters. Uh, so they must uh, report to us. In fact, most of our reports are from friends. They're not from the complainant directly or the victim uh, of a particular assault or violation. Uh, they're from people they've shared that with, and then those people are reporting to us. So I think actually our, the record has been good uh, in terms of those people performing their responsibilities. What promises can you make to past, present, and future students um, who might go and report a, a complaint to the Title IX office? What should they expect from the university? Well, they're going to expect a fair and full uh, assessment of their case. Uh, if it is a, a relatively recent case, they're going to get a full investigation. If it's an old case, like some of the cases that have been coming up lately, uh, and there is a nexus, let's say it's a 25 or 30 year old case, and, but there's a nexus to today, we will conduct a full investigation. Uh, some of those old cases, though, become very challenging to investigate because um, evidence is gone or extremely difficult to find. The people are gone, uh, so they can be a, a real challenge. That said, even if it's a 25 or 30-year-old case and there's some connection to the university today, we will do a full investigation of that. The third thing that I think they can expect are interim measures. Uh, so even if it's an old case and and, and the lack of resolution of the case meant that the person dropped out. The person ended up uh, with bills because they 
uh, took out loans or didn't complete their degree or incurred fees or whatever, uh, we're addressing those, those uh, uh, challenges through interim measures. Uh, and so I think they can absolutely expect that, right? So extending uh, their time, waiving fees, uh, providing tuition uh, payments uh, so that they can get back on track and, and try to continue uh, their education. These are very, very difficult issues though. And so, uh, you know, they're extremely emotional. Uh, people have been damaged. Uh, I don't think there's any getting over uh, these cases, you know, especially the victims, and so you know, we we are doing our very, very best to remedy what we can. We also provide uh, assistance uh, through you know, psychological uh, supports. We have partnerships with uh, community organizations who are advocates uh, for victims, and so I think there are a number of things that uh, that a complainant can expect from us, and those are a few. When it comes to resources and staffing. And I know the budget is particularly grim right mm -hmm. now. Do you have the resources to continue properly responding to Title IX complaints? We've doubled uh, staffing uh, in Title IX. We were at seven when I showed up. We're at 14 uh, right now. Uh, we've close to tripled our spending. So most of that, of course, goes to people, but a lot of it also goes to uh, training uh, programs and, and communicating to people. Uh, so we're uh, close to two million dollars a year now. Uh, we were at under, you know, about six, seven hundred thousand uh, when I came. So, uh, and in fact, I don't, frankly, I, I, I shouldn't say that I don't care what happens with the budget because I deeply, deeply care what happens with the budget because uh, if we're not successful there, that really, that'll impair our mission. Uh, but if you were to look at the scenarios that I've shared with the Board of Regents uh, on the budget, in all of those scenarios, uh, we are increasing funding for Title IX, in all of them. Uh, and in, in my four years at the university, each one of those budget years, we've been cut. Uh, well, one, we didn't get cut. Um, but we have cut deeper in order to reallocate into priorities. Uh, and even prior to getting funding from the state for an increase in funding for our Title IX, uh, we reallocated internally to step it up. Uh, I pulled together all our uh, Title IX and HR investigators and, and communicators last summer uh, and asked them, what do you need uh, so that we can really get this job done well? And they said, well, we need a few mil over a million bucks in new positions and training and supports and systems and that sort of thing. And I said, done. And we're not going to wait. This is not something you wait for some political budgeting process to do. It's the right thing. Uh, to do and you do it right now and so that's what we did. I want to make sure I'm not missing any of the important stuff because I know our time is somewhat limited. When you talk about, I think I've heard you say it um, publicly in an address to the university and I, and I think you said it here as well that we're not perfect, we have room to improve mm -hmm. but we're trying. If you could change something to better the university's response to these kinds of issues, is there any action item you can think of right now that could improve the situation? Well, one biggie, uh, I've got a couple ideas. One is to continue uh, with strong staffing. Okay. Uh, because if you don't have a critical mass of staff uh, experts in this area, you end up with very high burnout. So continuing to uh, support those people as well. Uh, so that they're able to bring their very best to their work of counseling and to their best, uh, the best they can do in terms of training and then also investigating and, and working these cases. Uh, so that's, a, I think, a, a top priority. Another thing, and it's, it's really beyond my power, I, I think, or perhaps all of ours, but uh, we need uh, greater clarity uh, around the, the rules and the guidelines. And of course, the Federal Department of Education has been uh, working on revising rules uh, that we're supposed to follow uh, in these cases. And often the rules are very unclear and even conflicting. And that puts us in a difficult situation where we might be sued uh, by the, uh, the complainant or victim in a case, and we might be sued by the respondent in a case uh, with very unclear Exactly, and so you know we end up often in a, in one of these impossible positions of being damned if we do and damned if we don't. Now we're going to power through that and, and do our best, uh, but I think more clarity around the rule set. When you say the rules, like what rules? Standards of evidence. 
okay. for example, or uh, representation at a, in a hearing, those sorts of, of questions. Those are the sorts of questions that are being worked out now uh, by the Federal Department of Education. Um, there were, I believe, over 100,000 comments submitted um, to those draft rules. And sometime this fall, we expect to get those, those guidelines from the Fed so that we know uh, with greater clarity uh, what the rules of, the, of this process are. So that would be, I think, very helpful. Uh, as well. So when we talk about transparency, I'm mindful that there's certain questions I probably have that you're not going to answer today. And I know there's pending litigation and I have a list that was given to us before this interview. Things that you can't talk about including um, specific Title IX cases, whether in litigation existing or old cases, uh, including the Yesner litigation, any specific allegations past or present. Um, one might look at that list and, and wonder if, if the university is trying to, to dodge questions or accountability, but I'm curious for you personally, do you wish you could say more? I can say my job is to, is to represent, and my mission, uh, my personal commitment, my professional commitment is to, is to do my very best for the University of Alaska. Uh, and uh, doing that, I think, uh, requires that we let judicial processes go through their, their course, uh, that we actually honor legal uh, protections for privacy. Uh, I think those are critically important things, and that's why I'm uh, not willing to go into uh, details, because it's not in our university's interest uh, to, to do that, uh, legal interest, uh, et cetera. Uh, but I think the, the uh, commitments that we have made demonstrate very strongly uh, our, um, our our demonstrated uh, uh, oh I'm, I guess commitment I, I used it uh, I'm, it's a circular sentence in a way but uh, uh, there's no question that we're committed uh, to doing the right thing for our students and for our community to try to to provide the most safe learning working environment we possibly can uh, to uh, uh, expend resources to make commitments. Uh, I think those are all uh, uh, positive steps in doing our very best. Again, we're not going to be perfect. Uh, we have roughly 7,000 employees and over 25,000 students. Uh, there will be mistakes made. There will be people who behave in ways that are inappropriate. Uh, and uh, then our obligation, uh, once those things happen, and they will, uh, then our obligation uh, is to uh, is to go through the process, investigate those cases, treat people respectfully, and and uh, essentially adjudicate these cases as uh, the best we can. When reading about the Yesner investigation, I saw a lot of people said, "That's just how he is. That's Yesner. That's David. That's that's who he is." It seems to be a common attitude that we hear about in other cases on college campuses, and not that's just the way it's always been. How do you shift that culture? That is a really insightful question because cultures take a long time to shift. And I guess what I would say there is um, perhaps the language is not shifting so much because there are a lot of aspects of our culture that are really, really good. And I don't want to throw those away or give those away, right? So I think uh, what we've been trying to talk about is as opposed to shifting culture, building on the really positive aspects of our culture. Catch people being good, right? Uh, because we, we do pursue truth. We do have people who care for our students and care for our, our faculty and our staff. Uh, let's build on those good values of honesty and commitment to learning and truth and safety, those sorts of things. And I think over time, as we build on those values, we'll be crowding out uh, the um, uh, those values that are not consistent uh, with our mission and with our purpose and our commi commitment to, to Alaskans. Uh, so, but it is going to take time. There's no uh, question about that. You know, I've been in this role for almost four years, uh, and I, we're not close, uh, really, to, uh, to, uh, to creating that, that new strong culture. I think we've made tremendous progress, no question about it, and we're not going to relent uh, from our commitment to that. Uh, to that mission of providing safe uh, learning environment for folks here at the University of Alaska. But it's going to take years and years, I'm sure. I mentioned that Hunting Ground uh, documentary. I would commend it to uh, all of the people viewing this interview. 
uh, because it, it addresses this issue at many universities all across the country and, and how challenging it has been nationally uh, to deal with this issue that is a long, long, I mean, it's a centuries old challenge. Uh, and I think we're, I really laud uh, the emphasis on addressing this challenge today. Uh, but I think it's, it's going to take time, no question. After the agreement uh, that you, the university voluntarily signed, um, we were told the University of Alaska would reopen 23 sexual assault and harassment cases from 2011 to 2015. Do you know the result of reopening those investigations? Did any of them uh, have a different outcome? Are some of them still being investigated? I wish I could answer that question. I don't know spe the okay. specific uh, outcome of those 23 Is cases. Is that something that we could follow up and, and get information on that? I'll do what I can and, and provide the information to you that's, that's publicly available. No question about that. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Is Dr. Yesner currently receiving a pension? I don't know exactly. I mean, I believe he has retired, uh, and so I don't know what retirement plan he was in, okay. uh, whether it's like a state a of Alaska plan or process for that or for for retiring. Yeah, sure. There's a standard process for retiring, which he did in I believe it was December of 2017. So he is likely receiving. You, I'm, I'm guessing you don't know for sure, but. Oh, I, I would be very surprised if uh, he is not receiving a retirement uh, either from the state of Alaska or the University of Alaska. Has any, so I understand from you significant uh, efforts starting from before this agreement came out and the findings from this uh, federal investigation um, and a continued effort to be compliant. Did anything change specifically in policy or process uh, after March of this year when this Title IX investigation came out? I don't believe we've made any particular policy changes since then. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I mean, this is what I would refer to as, a, as an old case. Uh, I mean, some of them, uh, some of the allegations were more recent. Uh, but we, uh, not only were we the first university in the country to proactively disclose problems prior to the conclusion of the compliance review, we were the first to uh, propose to the Federal Department of Education a protocol for handling these old cases, uh, which they were very, very supportive of. Uh, and while we didn't wait until we knew about this old case to, uh, to promulgate that, uh, we did take that to the Board of Regents within the last year. Uh, and the Board of Regents approved that uh, old case protocol, which we now follow uh, in these older cases. How does that work? How does it work? Uh, so a complaint comes in, uh, maybe 25 or 30 years old, and as I think I explained a little while ago, we will, we will assess uh, that case. Uh, so lawyers uh, will look at that case, and if there is a nexus to the present, so let's say the alleged perpetrator is currently an employee or a faculty member or an administrator or anything, then it immediately goes into an investigation mode. Uh, if the person, if the complainant is still a student, uh, which is possible, uh, then we will move into investigation mode. If, uh, if, however, there isn't a clear nexus to the present, uh, we will then move to provide uh, some of those measures. Right? So we'll help that uh, complainant. We won't do the investigation at that point, but we'll try to provide measures to help that student uh, complete their education, uh, you know, whether it's by providing tuition waivers or something along those lines. So there's an assessment of every single old case. There are investigations uh, of cases where there's a nexus to the present. Do you know how many uh, investigations are currently ongoing within Title IX? offices throughout the system? I don't have the number at the top of my head. I'm sure, I'm confident it's hundreds of them. Hundreds of ongoing mm -hmm. investigations. Yeah. How could we get, could we get um, an updated number? We'll, at some point we'll, we'll, we'll provide you the most current uh, public numbers. Great. Yep. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
Is there anything else I didn't touch on that you thought I would ask you about or that you wanted to address? Well, th thank you. Uh, this, uh, while in my position I have uh, taken a leadership role on this issue, all of our chancellors at the University of Alaska, our Board of Regents at the University of Alaska, all of our student leaders, our faculty leaders of our governance organizations and our senates, uh, they have all stepped up uh, and played a leading role uh, in this critically important area. So while I, as a spokesperson for the university, am talking about it right now, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people across the University of Alaska who have been trained, uh, trained bystanders. They know how to see something that's problematic. They know how to report something that's problematic. Uh, and they are providing supports to our students or faculty or staff who are experiencing uh, these problems. So this isn't just one person. Uh, this is literally thousands of people across the University of Alaska, across the entire state, uh, who are committed to providing a safe learning environment, safe study environment for our students. With some of these older cases um, that might just be brought to light now as the conversation uh, continues and through the Me Too movement, we're seeing older complaints mm -hmm. that uh, you said, and I believe the Title IX uh, offices told us they think is a positive thing, that people are coming forward. What do you say to the complainants uh, who may never see uh, justice um, or, or change due to these old cases? It, the conduct occurred long before you got here long before this Board of Regents, some of it did. You know, you can't go back and rewrite the past, but um, you know, what, what would you say to those people whose lives and the trajectory of their careers might have been damaged or significantly altered by this in the past? I'm sorry. I mean, these are tragedies, right? They can't be fixed today so simply. It's, people have been hurt. Uh, and, you know, we as an organization, we as people can do our very best to help them and to grieve with them, uh, but it's not fair. I don't think the system is fair yet, frankly, uh, and it pains me to say that. Uh, that said, uh, at the University of Alaska anyway, we're going to be relentless. Uh, on dealing with these cases and also as supportive and compassionate as we can be uh, to the victims in these matters. Does the future look bright? <sighs> I think there's, you know, the only way I can see it uh, getting brighter uh, is by doing the things we're doing, which is through education. I mean, we've I think for thousands of years we, we, we've thought as human beings that we can improve our lives by educating uh, the young uh, and then practicing uh, living up to our morals and living up to our standards. And so I, I think we're doing our best to, to do just that imperfectly, uh, but uh, I think we will uh, we'll make progress in Alaska uh, by taking on that responsibility at the university. And if we can uh, keep that up, uh, and get more students flowing through here uh, and, uh, and be a strong university, not only for the last hundred years, uh, but for another hundred years, I think we'll, we'll make a, a positive impact on our state and on society. That's all the questions I have. Good. Thank I really you, Danny. I appreciate you sitting down and having a conversation with us. Well, you're welcome. It's a really important issue uh, for us at UA and for, for all of Alaska. And, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about it with you. Absolutely. Good.